it happened. The unthinkable, the shift that showed our frailty. Nonetheless, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. We are separated, we are isolated, and in this world, we have trouble. Nonetheless, we take heart because Jesus has overcome the world. We are conflicted and frustrated, weary too. But nonetheless, those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. We are down but not out, sidelined but still in the game. We fight for our families, we hold on to love, we strive for kindness, but the hard times get harder. Nonetheless, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. We walk through adversity. We are sons and daughters of the Most High. We know to whom we belong and we know where our hope lies. For he is the first and the last the Alpha and Omega, the one who is and the one who is to come. It looks bleak, they say it's grim, there's a lot to fear, but none the less. We are strong. We are courageous. We are the church. Welcome once again to New Silks with Lockdown Worship. It's we get. We now have a road map out of lockdown, but it's looking like quite a long road with many twists and turns and fairly poor visibility. So here we are again, isolated in our homes, but connected not only by technology, but also by the Holy Spirit present in our hearts and lives, bringing comfort and power and reminding us that we are the Church of Christ and we're all one in him. We have one greeting this morning from Ellen. She's the boss round these parts. Good morning, North Street Church. Hope you're all well and happy on this quite nice day. It's a bit cloudy. Missing everybody. Hope to see you soon. Take care and uh, watch what you're doing. Bye. We told that we're going to be unable to go on holidays abroad this summer. So as a public services broadcaster, we want to help fill that gap this morning and we're going to take you all to Greece. Yay! Happy days! Well, sort of. Unfortunately, we're not taking you to a sun-drenched beach. Instead, we're going to take you back in time to Athens, to Mars Hill. And we're going to listen to the Apostle Paul talking to the great and good in that influential city, telling them about the one God who made heaven and earth, a God who cannot be confined to man-made temples or cast in stone but a life-giving God at work throughout his creation. I'm delighted this morning that our preacher is Malcolm Muir, and we will hear from Malcolm later as he opens Acts chapter 17 for us. But right now, we're going to sing our introit. Be still, for the presence of the Lord is here.
Worship God in the morning sunrise. Lift your voice in the evening rain. Bring your thanks and praise, all your accolades to him. Loving God, you are beautifully different. You are gracious in your thoughts. You're the friend who's proven faithful. You are love laid down for us. We are caught up in your beauty. We are always in your thoughts. Even in our disappointments, we are known and we are loved. With these wonderful words of the hymn of adoration, let us come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you that once again we can gather together, each in our own familiar surroundings, to worship you. We are as one because you are our Lord. You are our faithful God. It is you who binds us together. We are with partners or family, and some, like me, are sitting alone. But we know that God is always with us. God is present in our lives and longs to have a relationship with us. Although we cannot see you, Lord, we know we are not alone because you have sent your spirit to support and comfort us, a friend to encourage us when times are tough, the spirit to empower and inspire us. But sometimes, Lord, we get our priorities wrong. When the world around us is too distracting and we simply do not hear you when you call. We make mistakes, we turn away and we shut you out when your truths are inconvenient and we are not strong enough as we should be. Forgive us, Lord. Renew us, Lord. May your spirit of truth abide in us and lead us in the right way your way. When we know the reality of your presence and feel your love and care, your interest in each and every one of us, we are overwhelmed and amazed that no matter what we feel or think, you choose to love us and accept us just as we are. Your love is so vast, so great, so generous, so forgiving. May your spirit of truth abide in us and lead us to live in your love and share that love with others. We praise you, loving God, in the name of Jesus, our guide and helper, and in the power of your spirit. Amen. And now, let us join together and say the words our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for ever and ever. Amen.
we continue in this season of Easter to read from two books that we've been dipping into for several weeks now, the Gospel of John and the Acts of the Apostles. Now that's quite handy if you're following in your own Bible at home, because these two books are next door neighbours in the New Testament. We're going to hear from John chapter 14 first, where we listen to Jesus promising the, the disciples that he's going to send the Holy Spirit. So we get an anticipation of what we will be celebrating in a couple of weeks' time, May the 31st, on the day of Pentecost. And then we're going to hear from Acts chapter 17. Paul is in Athens and he's trying to find a way to talk about God to people belonging to a culture that has little or no understanding of the God that Paul worships. A problem that is all too familiar for us Christians in our secular society today. And I'm delighted that our readers this morning are the Huron family. So many thanks to Catherine, Alice, Jack and Danny. And then after the readings we're going to hear from Markham. John chapter 14 verses 15 to 21. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask the Father and he will send another companion who will be with you forever. This companion is the spirit of truth whom the world can't receive because it neither sees him nor recognises him. You know him because he lives with you and will be with you. I won't leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live too. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father. You are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them loves me. Whoever loves me will be loved by the Father. And I will love them and reveal myself to them. Amen. 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 Acts chapter 17, verses 22 to 31. Paul stood up in the middle of the council on Mars Hill and said, People of Athens, I see that you are very religious in every way. As I was walking through town and carefully observing your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. What you worship as unknown, I now proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, is Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't live in temples made with human hands. Nor is God served by human hands, as though he needed something, since he is the one who gives life, breath and everything else. From one person God created every human nation to live on the whole earth, having determined their appointment times and the boundaries of their lands. God made the nations so they would seek him, perhaps even reach out to him and find him. In fact, God isn't far away from us. In God we live move and exist. As some of your own poets said, we are his offspring. Therefore, as God's offspring, we have no need to imagine that the divine being is like a gold, silver or stone image made by human skill and thought. God overlooks ignorance of these things in past times, but now directs everyone everywhere to change their hearts and lives. This is because God has set a day when he intends to judge the world justly by a man he has appointed. God has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Amen. Hello. It's good to be with you, even if it is only through technology and not physically. I was planned to be with you at New Silksville today, but then the coronavirus restrictions hit us and we can't meet in the building. So can I say thanks to Richard for asking me to contribute online. I'm guessing that with the current lock-in, like me, you're losing track of which day it is, never mind where we are on our church calendar. Today is the sixth Sunday of Easter, and we are coming towards the end of the 50 days leading up to Pentecost, when the resurrected Jesus kept his promise to ask his Father to send the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, to help us and be with us forever. We are told about that promise in the passage from John's Gospel we heard earlier. It's part of the final instructions Jesus gives to the disciples after they meet for their last meal together. We will have to wait a couple of weeks to hear about the fulfilment of that promise at Pentecost, 
So today our lectionary jumps forward some 20 years to Paul's second missionary journey, where we see the Holy Spirit in action, guiding Paul when he visits Athens. Paul, born a Roman citizen, a Jew, a Pharisee, and a persecutor of the followers of Jesus. In Acts chapter 9, originally named Saul, he relates how he became converted from a persecutor of Christians to a devout follower of Jesus. While on the road to Damascus, he reports being blinded by a vision. He hears the voice of Jesus asking, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul replies, Who are you, Lord? To which the Lord answers, I am Jesus, who you persecute. For three days after this vision, Paul remained blind and fasted. He was then healed of his blindness by a Christian, Ananias of Damascus, after which he went on to proclaim Jesus Christ, dedicating his life to spreading the Christian message throughout the world. In his missionary journeys, Paul taught that the old religious rites, such as circumcision, were no longer necessary. He taught that faith in the redemptive power of Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to save sinners, was the essence of the Christian faith. Our reading from Acts today tells of how during his second missionary journey, after some conflict with his preaching in Thessalonica and Berera, he escapes to Athens, where he waits for Timothy and Silas to join him. While there, Paul was distressed to see that the city of Athens was full of idols. Paul visits the synagogue and the marketplace on a number of occasions to preach about Jesus. Some of the Greek leaders then took him to a meeting at the Areopagus, or Mars Hill, as it is known today, to explain his beliefs. Areopagus literally means the Rock of Ares in the city, and it was the centre of temples, cultural facilities and a high court. It is thought Paul could have been brought there for trial, as it may have been illegal to preach a foreign deity in Athens. At the Areopagus, Paul uses the rhetorical and speech-making skills he learned as a young man in Tarsus. Paul preaches one of the fullest and most dramatic speeches we have recorded in Scripture. His speech can be seen not only as a sermon, but also a combination of a guest lecture and a defence plea at a trial. Today, a plaque stands in the ruins at Mars Hill, inscribed with a copy of his speech. Paul begins with an attempt to coach a favour with his audience and find a connection between their beliefs. Athenians, he says, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. He then speaks for his observations in the city. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. Guided by the Holy Spirit, Paul doesn't criticise this altar, but sees it as an opportunity to connect the God he proclaims to a God they already admitted might exist, thus demonstrating his skill in sharing Christ. Too often today, Christians feel compelled to criticise non-religious people or those of other faiths, but Paul does not do this. He bases the remainder of his speech on this observation, even though hidden in the compliment is an implied criticism. That which you worship in ignorance, this is what I am proclaiming to you. Paul then declared the central belief of both Judaism and Christianity. God is the maker of all things and, as such, does not live in temples made by human hands. The people gathered at the Areopagus would have agreed with this. Paul goes on to note that the entire human race derives its existence from God, and that God gives life, breath, and everything else to us. Paul's listeners would have again nodded their heads in agreement. At this point, all that Paul has said was consistent with the beliefs held by many Greek philosophers. Paul moves on to win his listeners over. God made the nations so they would seek him, perhaps even reach out to him and find him. In fact, God isn't far away from any of us. Your unknown or hidden God actually hopes to be found. This God came to reveal himself to us in Jesus and is quite near, 
as near as the air we breathe, says Paul. Your pagan gods might live on Mount Olympus, but the God I proclaim is very near. Paul then quotes two Greek poets, Epimenides, in God we live, move and exist, and Laratus, we are his offspring. Paul justifies his faith by anchoring its truths in things the Greeks already believed. Only then does Paul criticise the Athenians for worshipping gold and silver deities, but is careful to note that his God is patient and forgiving and will overlook their misguided beliefs. In closing, Paul proclaims that with the coming of Christ, God seeks to reveal himself in us. God is calling the human race to repent, to change their lives and their hearts. Just as when we proclaim Christ to others, there was a mixed reaction from the Athenians. Some sneered. However, others became believers and founded a church in Athens that is one of the important centres of Christianity today. I wonder, if Paul were to come to Sunderland today, what shrines, altars and idols would he see? He would certainly see a lot of churches and other places of worship, mostly empty, even before being temporarily closed by coronavirus. I wonder what he would think about coffee shops, health clubs, fast food outlets, casinos, golf clubs and all the other places where people worship today, offering our sacrifices of time, talent and treasure. I suspect Paul would recognise the similarities between our community religion and the community religion of the Greeks. Would he still notice that the unknown God is doing pretty well? The God of the shops, the insurance policy God, the God that covers all the bases, the God that hedges the bets, the God of doubt, even among believers. And the question Paul had to address still needs to be asked. As Christians, how do you and I engage with this diverse modern culture? How do we talk to our children? who are now unaffiliated, maybe even agnostics or atheists? How do we talk to relatives and partners who are more religiously conservative than we are, as they try one of the many options that life offers today? Paul says, What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. Or put into today's language, let me show you another way. Paul understood that we are all seekers, searching for a relationship with higher powers. We grow up for God and yearn for relationships with meaning, for community, for identity. As Christians, we need to pay attention to what Paul accomplished at the Areopagus, and particularly the way he engaged the Athenians. Christendom has been declared dead. Christian values are no longer the undisputed model in today's society. The fastest growing religion today, at least before the coronavirus crisis, is none. We need to develop new ways of speaking to our questioning world. In many ways, we as Christians are in a similar situation to Paul, and we must learn how to proclaim Jesus Christ in this new Areopagus that surrounds us today. Many people seem to be exploring their faith as a result of the current threat to our health and way of life. Let us, like Paul, be guided by the Holy Spirit to proclaim Christ to them. Let us speak out with faith and confidence, knowing God, hearing his word of comfort and encouragement. Let us follow the Spirit that Christ promised, the Spirit that leads us on paths towards destinations we can never imagine. Amen. This coronavirus crisis comes with a huge personal cost for many people. We're struggling to liken this to anything we've ever experienced before. If not at war, people aren't fighting and losing their lives in that way. But people are dying and every life lost is a tragedy. Lives are being changed and some of those changes will leave scars that will always be felt and seen in many lives. But in the midst of pain, there can be healing. 
In the midst of sadness there can be peace, and after despair there is hope. For where there is hurt, there, right there in the darkness, you will find the presence of a loving God. Bev is one of those people who will never forget Covid. She will carry some of those scars for the rest of her life. But she's discovered that even in the dark devastation of bereavement, there was blessing and hope. So listen carefully now, as Bev tells us her personal lockdown story. Lockdown for me has been a game of two halves, devastation and blessing. At the beginning of the seven weeks lockdown, we lost our mum, Nancy, to COVID-19. She'd gone to hospital from a care home with breathing difficulties. Not being able to be by her side at the end after journeying with her through dementia was very difficult to deal with. Even though we knew she was at rest with her Heavenly Father, the grief was still unbearable. Then facing a funeral with only four people present and not being able to hug family members, just devastating. Even grieving has been unlike anything I've experienced before, just surreal. And yet I've also experienced God's love and presence in a very real way through lockdown. Prayer support from people near and far away has given me a deep inner peace. Daily telephone calls from family and friends and people coming to see me, standing on the driveway and crying with me because hugs weren't allowed, has shown me God's love and care in action. Cards, flowers and messages brought comfort and the beginning of healing. I know God is in my situation and if I keep my eyes fixed on him, there is a hope and an assurance that all will be well. Mam has claimed her crown of everlasting life and this gives me faith to trust in Jesus and stand on his promises. He is always with us. He will never leave us. And he will, and his unconditional love is everlasting. Being in lockdown has been hard but it's also been a chance to connect with Jesus and others in a deeper and more meaningful way.
now it is time for our prayers of intercession. Jesus reassured his disciples that he would leave his spirit with them to encourage and comfort them in the good times and the bad. So loving Lord, we bring to you the needs of our world. Let us pray. We pray for the voice of peace in places of violence. Since lockdown, the number of calls to domestic helplines has risen by 25%. People are dying in our country, in their own homes. And magistrates deal daily with cases of abuse and violence that continues behind locked doors. Further afield, Lord, we know that a large portion of the globe is engulfed in some form of conflict. Earlier this week, we heard of the attack on a hospital in the Afghan capital, Kabul. And we as Christians must agree with the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who appeals for peace and says, the virus does not care about nationality, ethnicity or faith. Loving God, hear our prayers. We pray for the voice of compassion, which we read and hear about every day during lockdown. Lord, guide and protect all the people in our NHS and our communities, whose work brings them into contact with children, the elderly and the sick. The sympathy, the understanding, the sensitivity and kindness that they show is immeasurable. And clapping for five minutes, Lord, safe on our doorsteps on a Thursday evening simply does not feel enough. Loving Lord, hear our prayers. As we have come to the end of Christian Aid Week, we pray for the voice of justice. Charities working across the world and in our own country, supporting the poor, the needy, the homeless and the hungry. Changing lives, not in word alone, but in truth and action. Loving Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for the voice of love in our homes and in our communities. With the help of the Spirit, may we be that voice across the garden fence, along the street, in the queue at the supermarket or on our daily walk, on the phone or messaging family and friends. May we continually seek ways to build relationships and forge bonds of trust that offer the love which God has freely given to us. Loving Lord, Hear our prayers. Loving God, we ask these things in the name of Jesus, our friend and companion, and in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to sing a wonderful song now. It's Matt Redman's 10,000 Reasons. The verse starts with these lines. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Notice... It's your song, not my song. Both as a church and as individuals, we need to be singing God's song, singing his praises to keep us moving on and looking up. So that, in the words of Matt Redman, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. There are 10,000 reasons and more to praise God, whatever your circumstances. This particular version was released last Sunday by the National Methodist Choir, of Great Britain, the Virtual Church Choir. Look closely, you may see one or two familiar faces. And also the next song the choir is going to do is called Everlasting Arms, which feels like a very timely song for just now. And it's not too late for you to sign up and be a part of that. So details of how to do that will be posted at the end of this service. Let's sing together now, 10,000 Reasons.
time of worship today is almost over but can I encourage you to keep worshipping and praising and serving as the week goes by 
and we look forward to sharing with you next week. Big thank you to everyone who has helped in any way this morning. It really has been a team effort. Thanks to Malcolm for preaching, to Barbara for the prayers, to Catherine and the lads for the readings, and to Bev for her wonderful testimony. In this coming week, let the majesty of the Father be the light by which you walk, the compassion of the Son be the love by which you walk, the presence of the Spirit be the power by which you walk. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you this day and always. Amen. We have one birthday coming up this week and it's this young man. We're going to sing happy birthday in a moment, but first of all, we need to send congratulations to Kay and Neil who celebrated their wedding anniversary last week. Congratulations to both of you. So let's sing. Happy birthday, dear friend. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear friend. Happy birthday to you. Last week we played out with the UK Blessing, uh, sung by uh, 65 uh, churches around the country as a blessing to the nation. Uh, this week we're going to play out with another version of the same song, this time sung by children. This is the Kids Blessing. Thank you. 
Hi. The National Methodist Choir of Great Britain are passionate about bringing people together to use their voices in worship and in song. But of course, during this time of social distancing, as churches and choirs are no longer to able to meet together and sing and worship, that's a real challenge. And so we're providing an opportunity for us to be able to do just that, to come together. And so I'd love to invite you to become part of a virtual church choir. The idea is that people from across the four corners of the globe, of every denomination and none, might find this a place to be able to sing and worship together, even though we are apart. Here's how to do it. If you get on the website, and the first thing to do is to vote. Um, there's a short list on the, on the website and you can cast your vote as to what you think we should sing. The second thing is to sign up. It's very straightforward and you'll become a member of the choir straight away online and have access to the members page. At the same time, you might like to also subscribe to the newsletter and then when a video comes along, it will ping up in your mailbox. And the third thing is to sing. And we're going to do that in a number of different ways. There will be video rehearsal tracks online for you to be able to practice in your own time. There will be opportunities for us to come together um, for some live streamed rehearsals. And when you're feeling happy and confident in what you're doing, then you can record your part at home and we'll talk you through how to do that. And then send us your recording of your voice and we'll blend together everybody's dulcet tones and create an angelic chorus. So I'd love for you to be part of the virtual church choir.